Uh, welcome, David Warburton from F5 Labs. Thanks, Sam. Thanks for... Thanks for sticking around. I'm sure it's got nothing to do with the ample amount of free beer here tonight. But um, I can't take all the credit for this. A lot of the research that's gone into this is through some of the work I've done, but some colleagues as well over in Tel Aviv. That we spent a lot of time... Well, let me start at the beginning. For those that don't know, you may have heard of the recent Nginx acquisition that we've made, but those of you that have probably still haven't heard of F5 Labs. Um, and so the one thing I love about my new role, I used to be an SE for F5, is now I can take the kind of vendor cap off because a lot of the research and work that we do is really designed to be agnostic. You know, hopefully a lot of what, we'll, what we do is designed to be relevant to our products and solutions, um, but we'll happily go and talk about things that we don't have boxes and widgets for. Uh, and that's um, part of what I want to talk about today um, is absolutely not a kind of product or vendor pitch at all, just some of the research we're doing into how some of the automated attacks are affecting the industry and apps at the moment. Um, so a bit about myself, I won't spend very long on this. Now, you'll have to forgive me, my job title has got the word evangelist in it, so I have to have a slightly bigger ego than most. I have to talk about myself a little bit. Um, as Sam said, um, a lot of my kind of security interest and, and um, experience was kind of peaked when I went back to uni fairly recently, back at Royal Holloway. Um, there I did quite a bit of work on bots and IoT. Um, and I've taken that forward recently working on things like TLS research and SSL. So a bit of a crypto nerd, but a slight detour today to, to look at bots. So we're going to start level setting, just really high level, you know, 101, what are bots, what do they look like? Um, we'll start looking at some of the more advanced techniques, what can they do, how can they impact your applications? Um, and then we'll also kind of finish off by looking at some of the common techniques we can use to identify bots, uh, some of the mitigations, some of the things we can use to stop them, and then how some of the more advanced bots are getting around those techniques as well. So these are some numbers from an external uh, company. This is from Global Dots, and they put together a report looking just at the sheer number of traffic that hits web applications each year. Um, now, it was a couple of years ago that the number of automated kind of connections over the web, so the number of bots that were hitting websites actually surpassed human, gen you know, genuine human users. Um, it's only just over, but the interesting thing is that over half of the bots that connect to apps are malicious. Uh, and in fact, Verizon kind of backed that up with one of their recent reports by confirming that over 75% of attacks that hit the web tier are automated. So, you know, we're not looking at individual human people that are trying to attack our websites. The majority of layer seven web app attacks are fully automated. And of course, this probably goes without saying um, because it's economies of scale. Now, I'm going to blame any formatting errors on Sam reporting this into Keynote. None of that's my fault at all. Um, now, bots affect every kind of industry, every website. Clearly, uh, most of us know, as soon as you have an IP or a port online, it's going to be hit by some kind of automated scanner, usually within a couple of minutes max. Now, the industry that you're in will slightly kind of vary and, and determine the amount of automated traffic that hits you. Clearly, there's a lot of automated IP-wide scanning that hits every single IP out there. But clearly, there are some industries that are more targeted to malicious bots than others. Now, some industries such as healthcare, you know, typically those industries that look to share data have a good amount of good bots. So the bots that are used to kind of automate maybe collection of data, maybe data sharing, and clearly those that have, you know, exposed some kind of financial interest for the cyber criminals um, have more than their fair share of malicious bots that hit them. Uh, and it probably goes back, uh, or probably goes without uh, too much surprise to say that airlines and gambling are the two most hit from malicious bots. Typically, we see the airline industry hit by scraping. It's other competitive sites, you know, looking to kind of scrape uh, up-to-date price information and then undercut them. Whereas gambling, there's a clear, you know, financial incentive for the bad guys to go after the gaming of gaming sites. You know, if you can figure out some vulnerability in an app or figure out the vulnerability in the random number generator that drives these kind of online gambling sites, then clearly there's a financial, uh, you know, motivation for these people. But what do we mean by bots? It's a pretty generic term, isn't it? So, I mean, bots to me is anything that, that automates a process. It's anything that is a non-human user. So it can be anything from a simple script to an app that you run on your desktop or laptop to go and fetch some content from a website on your behalf. Um, it could be a service that you use. 
Um, I use a couple to go monitor the status page, you know, monitor the status of some websites. You know, if that website doesn't have its own RSS feed, I can use some bots to go and basically scrape that site automatically, to, to, you know, to let me know when there are updates to that page. But generally, we're going to categorize bots into one of two or three camps. They're the good bots. And these really, as I mentioned, some of the genuine uses that we want to go and automate the processes and transactions on the web. We've got the slightly, what I'd say, morally ambivalent bots, the ones in the middle, that don't necessarily exploit vulnerabilities in applications, but they're maybe using their app, playing with the kind of business logic in a way that you weren't, you know, you never intended to expose your applications or users to. Uh, and then finally, we've got the bad bots that are just out there to purely commit fraud, generally to earn money, and they're looking to automate the process of exploiting vulnerabilities or otherwise gaming, uh, gaming the interface. So I can't start by, you know, not mentioning the, the Revolut chatbot. Uh, one example of a good bot. Um, you know, you can't have a conversation with a Revolut, you know, um, customer services representative without going to the live agent, you know, or sorry, the bot, I should say. And it's great because you can ask it some simple questions about transaction rates or, or, or questions about dates and things. And then if you come to a point where you need to ask a more detailed question or get a bespoke answer, you can get put through to a live agent. So that clearly automates a lot of the work um, from, the, from the Revolut support point of view. And then clearly we've got the search engines and the bots that go out trawling the web. This could be anything from the major kind of sites like Google and Bing who go and trawl the web for indexing purposes through to partners that will scrape your site to, you know, to resell your prices for, um, for tickets or what have you. Now helpfully, OWASP have put together another top list. We've, I think most people have heard of the top 10 uh, for web app attacks. They have what was the top 20, now I think they've stuck another one in, 21 automated attacks for, uh, oh sorry, the top automated threats that web applications can face. So for most people, I think they're probably fairly familiar, you know, if you think of bots, what are the kind of problems a bot will call to your site or service? Uh, it's probably going to be some kind of denial of service. We've all heard of botnets, you know, creating huge amounts of traffic, taking down websites and networks. Uh, and scraping, I've mentioned as well a few times, you know, various industries like travel, retail sometimes, and, um, and airlines can, can face scraping problems as well. But there's a whole raft more. Some far more malicious than other ones. Um, and we'll go through a few of these. And again, I definitely recommend reading the, the, um, the OWASP um, automated uh, threat guide uh, for much more detail in terms of some of the types of attacks and then some mitigation advice as well. So the basic one is scraping, and again, this can be anything from your standalone um, Windows or Linux-based application. You'll run manually, and you can go and use it to maybe just trawl a website, grab all the content, grab all the kind of resources, PDFs, it could be grabbing images and, and what have you. And as well as standalone applications, there are browser extensions that will go and you know, allow people to do this on massively as well. And then, of course, there's just scripts or API calls, because clearly, whether it's for benign or whether it's for malicious purposes, there may not be the tool out there that does the job, so sometimes it's just a good old, you know, hand-coded bit of code or script that will go and do that for you. And then if you don't want to have to do the hard work for you, then there's scraping as a service. Now, sometimes you might use this for genuine, you know, business reasons, and there are genuine business reasons why services like this exist. You know, you may be looking to create some kind of price comparison website. Uh, but clearly, you know, these kind of sites and slightly less benign sites exist for malicious reasons. And if you can't find uh, a scraper out there on one of these sites that will do the job for you, for example, scraping Amazon bestsellers, uh, we see quite commonly uh, requests going out on dark and even surface websites to, to look for coders, basically, to help people, you know, scrape websites. Uh, I think this example is looking for a bot that uh, looks to gather a number of different sporting uh, odds from different gambling providers. And then essentially we'll go and automate the process of placing bets on the provider that has the best odds for that event. Now this is, one of, this is another example where you may look at this kind of tool, this, this kind of automated attack, and think it's not particularly malicious. This is basically a tool that will go and help shoppers go and automatically purchase products from websites. So this example uh, of copying is essentially an app from the Better Nike bot that will go and follow a Twitter feed and as soon as a new product is announced, log in with genuine credentials using genuine credit card details, go and actually pay, you know, purchase this particular product. They might purchase the one product, they might purchase 100 for resale. 
Clearly, this is a problem if you're going to be releasing limited stock and you want to give everyone a fair chance to get to your products because these people are using bots to automate the process and you know, perform a transaction in the kind of time that the genuine human user can actually do. Um, they're very common. Uh, there are, again, everything from browser extensions to downloadable apps that you can run. Some of them go up to the sort of four or $500 mark to, to actually purchase these. So these are you know, well-supported, well-financed applications. They have constant updates in terms of conflicts to make sure that the way they scrape and perform their transactions are all supported because clearly when we're updating our website, it might change the, the layout and, uh, and the interactions within the site. But we're going to get to the slightly more malicious now. Um, credential stuffing is, I think, I think it's fair to say, a growing problem. Uh, it's one that we certainly hear about in the news an awful lot more recently. Um, so credential stuffing is the idea whereby other people's breaches can affect your site because other people's breach we could point to a Marriott or to a Yahoo, you know, with the billions, I think, seven billion valid credentials out there on the web now. If we grab these valid credentials force them through proxies, we can then try, we can automate the testing of those credentials against victim sites. Now, occasionally they are used by organized crime to actually go and log into a site and perform some kind of transaction. Uh, but quite often they're used by the original perpetrator of the, of the breach to go and test the validity of credentials because when they go for resale on darknet sites, and this is a fully autom automated process on, on darknet sites, you can ask more for the credentials that you know are valid because you've tested them recently and, and obviously you can command more, uh, more money for them. So this is just a really quick example for those that haven't seen this kind of tool. Um, there are lots of ways of performing credential stuffing attacks. A really common one is using a tool called Sentry MBA. It's modular, uh, which means you can kind of, again, you go onto various, even surface as well as dark websites to download configs for, for various sites or services you want to attack. It has modules you can use to kind of upgrade it to perform basic OCR for capture challenges. So in this example, I'm just going through and I've kind of pointed to an internal test site. I've loaded in the config, which is giving it the kind of form parameters that we're gonna fire these credentials to. Um, now, usually you would go and send these transactions through proxies, and this is one of the first problems that we face with detecting and blocking these kind of attacks, is if you we're facing a brute force kind of challenge, then it's fairly easy to detect. We have a high rate of transactions from a certain IP address, maybe a high number of password attempts through one particular user account. With credential stuffing, though, we typically get one attempt at one set of credentials from one IP address, and that's it. And then there's a different attempt with a different set of credentials from a different IP address. Um, so it's very easy to detect. And again, one of the ways you will do that very simply, or one of the ways attackers will mask their attempts is to just load in a proxy list. So you probably saw as I was rabbiting away that we don't have a proxy in this example of just attacking the website directly, but I've loaded in a valid list of credentials, uh, at least valid from my uh, vulnerable website point of view. And we're firing up a number of bots, so we've got lots of different connections going off. Uh, we've only got 10 going off in this instance. Typically, again, we'd have thousands going through a whole range of external proxies to hide IPs. And in this example, we find six valid matches. So this is great, obviously, from a tax point of view. They can either go and exploit those credentials, they can resell them on the dark web, uh, but even better, if they're admin credentials, then we've potentially got the keys to the kingdom. But one that faces, um, I would say, probably more financial institutions uh, than any other, um, although it's certainly applicable, is the new account creation attack. Um, similar kind of concept, someone else's data breach, someone other valid credentials or you know, valid personal data can be used to automate the process of creating new accounts, which you might think, well, what's the point in that? You know? uh, and clearly it's down to money laundering. So the money mules will be given, you know, if we can automate the process of creating fraudulent um, accounts of banks or credit cards, for example, when it comes time to cash out, the attackers will launder the money through these newly created fraudulent accounts and it just makes it that much harder to, to track. So some data from threat metrics uh, about a year or so ago was looking at the number of new account creation attacks by comparison to all of the transactions that happen uh, on, a, on an app or a website. So you can see that the number of new account creations compared to just general logins or general payments transactions with a website is, is fairly low. I think the number was around about 1%. Uh, 
But you compare that to the amount of malicious transactions by transaction type, and actually it's fairly high, it's 3% compared to uh, only about 1.5% for genuine account logins. So this is a very real problem. It's been growing, particularly in Europe uh, and Australasia as well. So this is some data that we've got from some of the uh, sensors and honeypots we've got scattered around throughout the world. We quite regularly look at um, IoT traffic, so we look at a lot of kind of bot attack and automated scanning traffic. And typically we see the same sorts of ports being attacked from quarter to quarter and year on year. Um, there was a bit of a shift in the start of this year where certain well-known vulnerabilities against um, Samba file sharing and SIP were announced. And clearly, that's enough incentive for these scanners to just start sending a massive amount of traffic, crawling the IPv4 space, looking for any system that's open and listening and vulnerable to these, to these attacks. Now, with things like Autosploit, this gets even easier. So for those that don't know, Autosploit is a pretty wicked combination of Shodan, which is a pretty genuine, you know, useful tool to look for any open IP and port on the web. Uh, and Metasploit, the common attack uh, tooling framework. So by combining Shodan and Autosploit, an attacker can very simply say what kind of exploit do they want to run, what kind of attack do they want to carry out. Hit go, and it will use the IP database from, from Shodan to launch that attack against every single known instance over the web. So from a complexity point of view, you can see that really because of the tools that have been created, the amount of automation, most attackers that are carrying out these attacks are fairly young. Uh, they're around 17. The average age of a cyber criminal in the UK was 17. And you compare that to the average age of someone that commits financial fraud or sells drugs, which is in the late 30s to early 40s. Clearly, these young people are getting involved in cybercrime, if for no other reason than the tools exist there to just make it that much easier for them. So I mentioned IoT and, and botnet. So currently, we've got around eight and a half billion IoT devices. Now that doesn't even include smartphones, and tablets and uh, other kind of devices like that that we carry around with us. These are pure IoT devices from home routers to smart printers and fridges to TVs <coughs> and smart cars and all those kind of things as well. So if we consider that we've already surpassed the kind of current human population on the planet and we're now going to excess of possibly one trillion as predicted by SoftBank in 2035, that's a huge attack vector for people to start using these devices as really simple attacking tools for their automated bot purposes. Um, so you probably can't see this too well. What we're looking at here is the types of devices that are typically compromised in what we call thing bots, uh, thing bot attacks or thing bots uh, networks. Um, by far the most common are small office and home office routers. And I think there's probably a good reason for that is that by comparison, they have the same kind of vulnerabilities and issues as IoT. You know, they're typically installed by, or deployed by ISPs, they're stuck on, stuck on a, a home shelf, rarely get updated. But actually by comparison to your smart light bulb and smart fridge, have a decent CPU, they've got a decent amount of RAM and they're obviously direct connect, directly connected to the internet. So these things are, are pretty capable. So the vast majority of certainly large scale botnets are using small office, home office routers. But what we have seen is a shift in the kind of attacks that they're conducting. So you think botnet, I think most people probably think of denial of service attack. And that's probably still true. The, the number one kind of attack coming from botnets, or thing bots in particular, is denial of service, just overwhelming resources or network pipes to take down a service. But what we've seen is a shift in um, what we call multi-purpose bots. So essentially the attackers, when they compromise a device, are loading on code, basically a framework, a set of modules that allow them to then rent that botnet out for whatever purpose they want. Uh, it could be something to do with credential stuffing. It could be, to, it could be a DDoS attack, for example. Uh, recently, we've seen a huge shift in the amount of people that are using these devices to mine for cryptocurrency. Um, clearly, they're not going to get a huge amount of cryptocurrency per device, but when you've got hundreds of thousands of devices in your botnet, that's actually going to start raking in some decent Bitcoin. Mirai was a, a really great example of probably one of the biggest and most explosive botnets of recent years. It's hit, uh, it, it's, um, generally hit small office, home office routers, IP cameras, and DVRs. I think what's really impressive about it is just the speed at which this <coughs> exploded. 20,000 devices in less than a day. Um, and according to at least one study, at least 600,000 devices at its peak. I think it's fallen the last time I checked, it was around 300,000 to 400,000 devices. But this is still a significant problem. 
Um, I think most problematic with Mirai was the fact that, as it's fairly common to be honest, the, the author of the source code, or the author of the, um, the malware and botnet released the source code, um, and this deck I made maybe six, nine months ago at the time, there were 10 variants of Mirai, uh, and there's even more now. So clearly people are taking on this code and they're, they're expanding on it to you know, create their own botnets. Uh, Wicked, Wicked in particular is one example of one of the rentable botnets I mentioned whereby the host, or if you like, uh, that controls the C2 for Wicked will then rent out various parts of that botnet to do different things um, depending on what the, um, the third party attacker wants to do. Now, there are other ways that you know, IoT devices will be compromised, but most commonly it's just as simple as exporting default credentials on devices. Um, so there are, C there are instances of CVEs being exploited. Um, so I think it's Nuri is one of the newer Mirai variants. Uh, and that particular exploded at the end of last year when it was attacking or exploiting, I should say, I think PHP CVE. So that was very easy to go and actually exploit any system uh, that was vulnerable and start, you know, basically command it into the uh, Nuri botnet. Uh, but as I mentioned before, it's typically really just weak or default credentials that are the problem. Um, because it's simple, right? If you could just scan the IPv4 space, looking for open ports on Telnet, more commonly now SSH, um, and just try any number of password combinations. These devices typically don't have any password brute force checking going on, so they happily let you try a thousand passwords a second. Uh, it's no surprise that that's still, you know, the most common method of compromise. Now, for our part in the kind of Mirai story, uh, one of our researchers was traveling at a UK airport and was doing some research, let's just call it that, and saw a huge map traffic coming out from the IPv4 space of this, I was almost gonna say the name, this UK airport. Um, so we started digging into it and eventually figured out that the IP address belonged to um, a display board. So one of these kind of flight departure boards that gives you updated times for, for your flights. It was now commanded as part of the Mirai botnet and was sending out a huge amount of DDoS traffic. Now, what it turned out to be wasn't so much the display device itself that was vulnerable, it was a cellular gateway attached to this device. Because even in things like airports, where you'd think Ethernet and Wi-Fi is fairly ubiquitous, actually it's far easier to just stick a cellular gateway in the device that maybe you know, some kind of terminal half a mile away than it is to patch it in you know, using hard wires or Wi-Fi. But these, uh, these cellular gateways, um, and I'm kind of, I don't mean to pick on Sierra, we've got the logo down there because just by sheer fact of their popularity uh, amongst cellular gateway vendors means that a huge amount of vulnerable systems were, you know, were, were being produced by Sierra. But these devices are found everywhere, you know, from automated display boards and, and high res, uh, sorry, high res display boards. We've got emergency, serv emergency services vehicles that use them. Uh, for fleet tracking, and even industrial uh, devices like SCADA will, will use them to basically just provide very simple connectivity to devices that might be uh, you know, a mile or so away. Now, what's particularly worrying is that you know, if we look at the use case of emergency services vehicles, um, what our researchers were able to do was, well, we didn't know it at the time, so we were finding these IP addresses coming and going, so they would switch on, they would come on at a certain time in the morning, the IP address would disappear at some time of night. Um, and then while they were online, they were sending huge amounts of traffic and then dropping off. And what it turned out, again, this is what led us to determine that they were cellular gateways. And when we connected to the IP address of one of these vulnerable systems, it really helpfully provides us some kind of nice web interface to interact with that device. Um, now, ignoring all the SQL injection and cross-site scripting attacks that we found on it, um, not only did it have default passwords, but it also very helpfully gave us the GPS of the device itself. Um, and again, as we later found out, when we were tracking the GPS device going around, it turned out to be a police car in the States. It was you know, some guy, some cop, leaving his house in the morning, getting in his squad car, driving around, going to various kind of incidents, and then going home at night. So this is clearly a really big problem, and it exists because of these cellular gateways across all sorts of devices and networks. <coughs> Just a real kind of, well, what, another thing that we do with these honeypots and sensors that we do when we collect data uh, or analyze data is just, you know, try and get a feel for what attackers are going after, essentially. Um, and we've got here a quick snapshot. We, we typically catch and publish 
top 50 or top 100 most commonly brute forced credentials. And I use the term brute force loosely because, again, these aren't brute force. These are attacks we've seen in the wild where these specific credentials are used to try and log into to vulnerable and honeypot type systems. And what's crazy is that in a lot of these cases, not only are the credentials very weak, but the password is even the same as the username. So there's really no effort uh, being made to, to secure the system at all. Going back to Mirai, I mentioned DDoS. DDoS is still a real, you know, huge attack vector for, um, or attack method, I should say, for, for ThingBox. But what's interesting is when you look at the type of DDoS attacks that are launched, um, I think most people, I think network-based, volumetric-based DDoS attacks are still most common. But Mirai, interestingly, was sending out HTTP floods as the most common method of attack vector. Uh, again, typically because it's a little bit more challenging to try and mitigate. Um, so the one kind of thing I've mentioned with regard to F5 ourselves is when we had customers calling, ask for help to mitigate layer seven or web-based specific DDoS attacks, more often than not, it wasn't our kind of cloud scrubbing service that dealt with it, it was the CERT team, so the security and response team. Because typically, you know, mitigating those kind of attacks is more complex. You can't just whack a rate limit on something. You need to understand how the application works, and how does a volumetric or how does a, an HTTP flood differ from a genuine human user interacting with your website? So if we think about mitigation methods now, you know, it's, it's pretty easy to kind of block stuff at the IP level. So maybe let's use IP block list or maybe use geolocation. And that's clearly a good step, actually. Uh, a lot of services and, and tools will just perform simple IP uh, blocking to stop this malicious traffic. Uh, again, this is uh, some data we collected. It's a couple of months old now. Um, but what's interesting is the top attacking country. In fact, the top attacking countries. It's not just you know, one country like the Netherlands, but actually Canada, US, France, the UK are the top attackers against the UK in particular. So geolocation blocking, while useful, clearly isn't going to do everything for us. Now, you look at the actual IP address, and I'm going to read out the numbers here. So we've got 100% and then 80% if you can't see that. Um, because when we look at this attack traffic quarterly, we typically see 50 to 80% of repetitive IP addresses. So the attacking IPs are usually, if not 100% identical, they're usually very similar. The last few quarters we've monitoring this traffic, 100% um, of attacking IP addresses have been different, and 80% of ASNs were unique. So to me, what this says is we've got ISPs, because again, routers are a big problem, ISPs are shipping out new devices in the tens or hundreds of thousands to replace you know, legacy gear in consumer homes. They're vulnerable, um, and they're being used as, as kind of launch points uh, to launch these automated attacks. So user agents is something else we could try. Let's just figure out, very simply, looking at the user agent that the browser or client or app is giving to us. Um, now, depending on the resource you use, you'll see anything between a million and maybe two million plus different user agents. So that's a pretty big number to try and deal with. Um, we've got at least 4,000 of those are recognized as, as bots. Um, but clearly, user agents can be faked. You know, if, uh, if Google can say they're the Google bot, well, so can I. I'll just change my user agent when I go and connect to, to a website. Um, and in fact, in June alone, there were over 13,000 IP addresses that claimed to be Google bot doing a crawl of the website, but were of course malicious. Um, testing a few of those, no surprise. Small office, home office, vulnerable routers. Microtech have been in the news quite a lot recently uh, because there's so many vulnerabilities on their platforms. Um, one thing you can try and do to combat user agent forgery is to do a reverse DNS check. Because clearly, Google crawlers will only come from a certain range of IP space. And if you can do a reverse DNS check and figure out the attacking IP is within Google's IP space, then you can drop it. Now, another method is to actually, you know, more proactively challenge the client to actually test that, to test that client to see what it's capable of. Uh, because if you recall back to the, to the bots I mentioned, whether it's scripts or the apps or Sentry MBA even, most of those are capable of running simple things like JavaScript. So if we have a genuine customer coming into our web, uh, a web app or a WAF, or some kind of ADC or low balance or what have you, what we should be able to do is then send some kind of challenge back to the, to the customer or to the client, get it to compute some kind of arithmetic challenge maybe, and then send the result back. If the result's good, brilliant, we're gonna let the connection through to the web app. Malicious users or bots that aren't capable of performing this JavaScript 
should be blocked at the front door. And actually, we've got a quite a few examples. It sounds a very, very simple test and a very simple kind of mitigation step. We've had quite a few large uh, financial organizations, actually, that have been inundated with new account creation and credential stuffing attacks. Just a simple act of performing a basic challenge cut 80 to 90 percent of their bot traffic. So it's actually quite effective. Now, the problem with JavaScript challenges comes with headless browsers, because if you can automate a genuine browser, then you've got a valid user agent, uh, it's capable of running things like Ajax, uh, and executing JavaScript and all sorts, uh, and rendering genuine HTML. Um, so clearly these pose another problem, because they're gonna pass JavaScript challenges. Uh, they're often based on Selenium, which is one we come across time and time again. A lot of the headless browsers you see mentioned uh, will be based on something called Selenium. So Selenium is a tool, it's based on the WebDriver API, so it's a genuine API that's created to help web testers automate the testing of their apps, because, you know, why wouldn't you want to automate that? It sounds like a useful thing to do. But clearly, you know, you can, you can use this for malicious purposes. Uh, on the right, it's just to start some very, very simple code in which we're defining, uh, defining the, the form elements that we're going to basically automate the testing of. Um, and clearly, this is posing another problem, because if we're using Selenium to drive genuine Firefox or Chrome instances, then it's going to pass user agent challenges, and it's going to pass JavaScript challenges. So what do we do? Um, well, that problem gets even worse, potentially, when we've got now browsers as a service. I mean, everything's a service now. So even if you don't want to go and run your own instance of Selenium and have dozens of Firefox instances popping up and running on your machine, uh, just going to get someone else to do it. And again, these are really designed for genuine business purposes for automating the testing of your website, but again, these, are all co these can all be co-opted to use for malicious purposes. So who doesn't love a good capture? Uh, I'm kind of curious, I want to take a poll actually. Um, capture genuine useful mitigation method or biggest annoyance on the web that users face? I think probably the latter, to be honest with you. Um, that's one of the more recent examples. So fairly effective, or so you'd think. Um, but actually what we've been seeing a lot more of recently is the automation of capture um, validation. It's not quite capture bypass, you know, no one's bypassing the capture itself, they're genuinely completing the capture challenge. So a few different tools that we can use to do this. There are browser extensions, like I think we've got examples here. Uh, in, this, in this case, we've got a genuine user kind of browsing a website through a, a kind of full fat Chrome instance so we can see little instances, little kind of images being popped up, overlaid on top of the uh, capture image and the input field as well. So if you look at the code though, you'll actually see elements being inserted into the code, clearly to display within the web browser. Um, and these are some things we can do to try and mitigate or detect and then mitigate uh, capture challenges because they will usually insert some kind of code into the client, uh, client side browser as that website is rendered. Uh, I, I love the name of this to capture. This is one of our colleagues using this. Um, I think they should have called it too fast to capture, but that's my own personal opinion. So the, the thing that completes the capture challenge isn't OCR, like you might think. In some cases, like Century MBA, you can download modules or plugins that will go and perform basic uh, optical character recognition. And they do a decent job in some, you know, for some bespoke capture solutions. Um, it, for the majority of cases, though, capture solutions are provided by thousands and thousands of people just physically eyeballing and then entering the capture as they see them. So these are workers across all sorts of countries all over the world that are being sent the capture from the bot to complete. Uh, so this is, in, in this case, our research was kind of registered with 2Capture, one of the anti-capture services. Uh, I kind of spoke over it. I love the fact you had to enter a capture to use the anti-capture app. I think it's brilliant. <laughs> um, but once he's logged in, he then gets sent, as long as he's logged in, he will just be sent continuously capture after capture after capture for him to complete and send off. Now you can see the balance is pretty low. I think 0.019, and that's actually in dollars, that's not Bitcoin, so it's, it's not very much. Um, the idea being, of course, that in some countries it's actually worth quite a lot of money, and if you do enough of them, then you can earn some kind of living from it. Now, the way that most of these work, whether it's a standalone app, whether it's the API that you're calling for these anti-capture services, whether it's an extension, 
Typically what happens is your bot will go and connect to the kind of victim website. The victim website will, you know, quite rightly send back a capture challenge. That saved as a JPEG or some kind of image onto the machine, the victim machine, and then sent across to this farm, to this anti-capture farm. Um, it's returning a, a unique ID um, because at this point, you know, any one of the tens of thousands of, of anti-capture workers that are busily trying to fill in a capture challenge. Um, at this point then, uh, because it's genuine users, humans, you know, performing this, you might have to wait 8, 10, 15 seconds. So we're constantly polling the website or this anti-capture service with our unique ID. Uh, as soon as we have an answer, we send back the capture channel to the victim website and carry on scraping or attacking as we were otherwise. Now for recapture 3, it's slightly unique. So recapture 3 is not showing images. It's using a, it's making an API call to determine the kind of user trust score of that particular client. So if you've seen them, you'll literally just see, you know, click here to prove you're not a bot. You think, well, how is clicking here proving anything? But because the API call is going off and fetching a, a score, which rates your client from a trust point of view. So the score is rated from 0 0.1 to 9. And the way that the anti-capture services get around it is simply by constantly monitoring the client's score of each of their anti-capture solvers. Because what they figured out is that if you're getting a score of 0.1 from one website, you're more than likely going to get a, no a score of 0.1 from a similar website. So by using this kind of scoring system, uh, they can figure out that when the bot makes this API call to the anti-capture service, it will just pick the worker with the best score and let them solve it as normal. Um, the answer is returned. This time it's typically a, a massive kind of, I think, 256-bit token that gets sent back. Uh, that gets validated, and again, the bots are able to carry on doing what they were doing. So what about beyond capture? What else can we do? Uh, maybe we can look at genuine human user interaction. Clearly, human, you know, humans move the mice around, they click on things, uh, they take their time to browse websites. Well, unfortunately, all of this can be scripted as well. Um, so again, attackers can use bots, they can use automation to capture things like mouse movements, moving from certain elements to different elements, moving the mouse around and so on. Um, these are actually fairly effective. For what it's worth, it is more often than not possible to detect this kind of fake mouse movement because the mouse is usually not moving gradually around the screen. It's kind of jumping from one form element to another one to click on it to then do something with it, maybe to press a button or to interact or, or enter some data. So usually we can detect instant kind of mouse teleportation uh, as a sign that some bots, you know, interact with our site. So this is all very well for browsers. You know, we can send practical challenges, we can test the client in other ways. Uh, but what about mobile apps? Clearly, you know, the, the web's moving mobile and it's moving to APIs um, first. This is obviously a problem, and this is a known thing that attackers are exploiting, the fact that if they can go after APIs, specifically mobile APIs, there's quite commonly a lot less mitigation, a lot less protection in place in front of the API, and then you know that it's usually a weaker place that they can actually go and attack. So from that point of view, if we've got APIs and maybe non-human use interaction, we, you know, we can't do anything with in terms of testing browsers and, and agents. Um, the steps we've got typically are one of a couple of things. We can use, we can enforce some kind of strong authentication. Now, this is a bit easier for mobile apps that only allow interaction with registered users. They can check the validity of tokens and credentials and only let you know, the interactions with that valid user. For open APIs, though, it's a bit more of a problem. We can't enforce that kind of authentication. So we can detect things like get floods. So we can look at maybe the number of requests coming into a particular URL or for a particular resource. We can monitor the back end to look at how that's impacting you know, the server utilization. Uh, again, we can identify from non-human non <laughs> surfing patterns. So as well as mouse movements, how long is it taking for a user to go from one web page to another web page? Uh, typically, a user is going to spend seconds, if not a few minutes, on a web page uh, and not request maybe a thousand web pages over the, over the course of three seconds. But then more and more, we need to start looking towards kind of behavior, uh, behavioral uh, analytics and, and interaction. We need to start doing a lot more dare I say it, machine learning to try and figure out just spotting patterns before we even know they exist. Now in some basic cases, we can fingerprint the client so we can try and match the capabilities of what the user agent says it is. So maybe it says it's a mobile Safari browser that has a certain resolution that doesn't look right or doesn't support certain versions of uh, certain elements of HTML5. We can raise some kind of threat score 
Um, but beyond that, we need to start using more detections in terms of how it's affecting the back end, because actually we may not be able to detect accurately what's on the client side. We may have to use some kind of AI to figure out what's, you know, the impact it's having to the back end. Um, before that, though, extensions can be used. Um, again, I kind of picked out before in some of the capture extensions that will insert form elements so we can detect on those. And TLS handshakes is actually a fairly good one as well. You know, TLS handshakes are, are very, very unique um, per browser, per client, per app. And if you can actually figure out to a good degree of certainty that a particular app or client is what it says it is because it matches the cyber strings or versions of TLS that it supports, that's actually not a bad method to at least rate the score uh, of that connection coming in. And really, I'll just finish on the fact that we need to start improving, I think, uh, automatic detection and machine learning when it comes to looking at bots. Because clearly, when it's now over 50% of, of attack or 50% of traffic that hits the majority of websites, uh, these are all examples, by the way, of, of bots and AI being used to create fake images. We've got fake Obama. If you've not seen those, they're brilliant. You can get to say whatever you want. Uh, we've got fake people. These people don't exist. That's all being generated by um, AI, and then fake stories as well. So clearly, you know, the intelligence is there. The algorithms are there. At the moment, a lot of this stuff, though, is reserved to academia. Now, when it starts becoming more feasible for attackers to using AI in their bots, it's going to start becoming a lot more difficult to detect them and block them at the perimeter. And that's me. Thanks very much. Thank you, David. Uh, right, uh, I don't think we had any questions on Slido. Any questions from the audience? Yeah, I can see that.